Hello and welcome dear viewer. So today I'm gonna do something really strange. Inspired by the recent Alpha Phoenix video, uh, I'm gonna put some of my academic work into my YouTube channel. And namely I did this nice seminar on the origin and evolution of the web and I talked a bunch about JavaScript and I thought it was a really fun topic and a bunch of people on the Serenity OS server also enjoyed it and I got a really good grade and I had a lot of fun so I thought why not put that on the internet um, basically what this is going to be is just a quick little presentation about some of the things I researched and you can read like the long report which I actually submitted with some adjustments so if, if you're more a bit more interested in that you can read up the full report but anyways this is just going to be a nice little presentation i'm going to talk about the history of javascript uh, if you're interested into that uh, then listen to me okay so as you can read the title of the report and that's actually the report title is JavaScript, the web's computational basis that was never meant to be, or you can't invent a high-performance programming language in a weekend. Anyways, um, here's the outline, and um, I was focusing on three main questions while doing this report. First of all, why is JavaScript popular despite being so slow? Why is JavaScript like popular in general? And why did JavaScript win against all the other early languages? Uh, so this is a fun presentation that that's kind of the, the thing it's not really something you would expect out of academia but I decide to have fun so you can read the report if you want to know about like all the boring stuff or like all the in-depth stuff anyways so let's start at the beginning in the beginning there was Brandon Ike and Ike was kind of a well-known um, language developer whatever um, he invented JavaScript, as you might not might or might not know, in 1997, in 10 days for the Netscape Navigator 2.0, uh, because Netscape wanted like a simple scripting language for animations, that sort of stuff, um, to put into their uh, second release of the browser. Um, and this is this is like these 10 days. That's actually true, and it's a kind of famous story. Um, you can see Ike here in 2018. And yeah, arguably he kind of succeeded at that, uh, at least at first, like he managed to create a simple language for the amateur. Um, I'm sure if you have ever written JavaScript before, that's uh, something uh, you might have noticed that it's rather easy to get into. Uh, just a funsies, a couple of days before I, um, before I started, uh, writing this presentation um, there was a twitter post by live overflow i'll definitely link it in the description where he showed that <laughs> navigator 2.0 can't load google anymore and so this is just to give you an impression of uh, of what uh, netscape navigator 2 would have looked like and as you can see javascript has evolved since then uh, so let's actually look at like the early language competition because um Maybe you remember, maybe you don't, uh, that um, JavaScript wasn't the only language on the web for quite some time. And there were three main competitors, and I want to look at why they didn't win. So first of all, we had Java. Um, Java was around longer than JavaScript, and it was always kind of complex. You had to use compilers and that sort of stuff. Um, it was intended to do these complex embedded applications. And for that reason, it was also sandboxed. But as you probably know, um, it it consistently to this day misses the mark of being secure. Um, like log for shell is just one recent example. They're like all the way back to like the CVE index in 1998. There is really heavy uh, sandbox escape and arbitrary code execution vulnerabilities in Java. So Java sort of gained this... Um, this reputation for being incredibly insecure. And you can see in the rightmost graph that around 2015, when um, when all major browsers disabled Java applets by default, it sh saw a sharp decline in popularity. You can see long before that, Java basically wasn't relevant um, in terms of language usage uh, on the web. That's the leftmost graph. So 
Now you might argue, okay, well, but JavaScript also has a bunch of insecurities, especially in its implementations. But like, that's the point. JavaScript has a bunch of different implementations, uh, at least three or four. And if there is a vulnerability, it's usually just in one engine. So all the other engines aren't affected, which means that uh, there's like less of an attack vector and or, or less of a vulnerable user base. And for Java, in turn, there's like just one implementation, Oracle's implementation, or Sun's implementation at that time. Um, so if that's vulnerable, everyone's vulnerable. So that's a major difference. And that's one of the main reasons I think that Java didn't uh, win against uh, JavaScript, um, as well as the complexity, of course. And second, we have ActionScript, which is like also a JavaScript descendant, but it's uh, incompatible and it's part of Flash. It's like the scripting language behind Flash. And the reason that that never won against JavaScript on the web is pretty obvious. It's essentially standalone. It doesn't, um, can't interact with a web page in any way as JavaScript can. It was always intended to be like this standalone language. So, um, and also it was rather insecure, um, as you might know. Um, it was retired in 2020, in the end of 2020. I hope I don't. Uh, get any of the any of this uh, wrong on the internet, um, and you can see that it had a steady decline from like 2011, uh, where I have data on the left side of the graph. You can see that. Finally, Visual Basic. Visual Basic. There's a bunch of variants. I don't want to get into that. <laughs> um, I technically only have 20 minutes, um, and Visual Basic was a always a proprietary Microsoft Internet Explorer technology. Um, so if you as a web developer wanted to have maximum compatibility even during the near monopoly of Internet Explorer in like uh, 2005, around that time, um, you still wanted um, to use the most general language that everyone supported, which was JavaScript. And, and part of the reason for that is that JavaScript was standardized very, very early on. And that's... Uh, in 1996, I believe, they went to ECMAScript and uh, standardized the language in part to get Microsoft to catch on with their implementation. And uh, yeah, we have ECMAScript to this day um, and everybody has to follow this baseline of standardization, which helped uh, JavaScript adoption on the web uh, very much, in my opinion. And from that point on, like we're jumping around in time, but like, let's go back to like 1995, 1996, um, until about 2000s, when I would argue that uh, the language wars were almost over. Um, this uh, JavaScript expanded in scope massively. It got more and more features. And so performance became more and more relevant. Um, so as an introduction to why JavaScript is slow, let me play you this short excerpt of the what's of JavaScript. But before you're asking, I actually did that in the live presentation. Let's talk about JavaScript. <laughs> <laughs> Does anyone know in JavaScript what array plus array is? Well, let me ask you this first. What should array plus array be? Empty array. Empty array. I would also accept type error. Uh, that is not what array plus array is. No. Wrong. <laughs> Wrong. <laughs> array plus array is empty string. <laughs> Obviously, I think that's I think that's obvious to everyone. Uh, now, what what would array plus object be? This should obviously be type error because those are completely disparate types. Uh, does anyone know what this is? Uh, no, close. No, far away. It's object. <laughs> right, right, nicely done. Now, of course, because uh, this is plus, so you can flip the operands and the same thing comes out. So, if we do what? No, that's just an object. Uh, if you do object plus array, you should get exactly the same thing, which, as you can see, you do. <laughs> and finally, uh, the only one of these that's actually true is uh, because, you know, you add arrays, you get empty string, that doesn't make sense. But an object plus an object is actually not a number, technically. <laughs> so this one's actually right. And uh, exactly, right? Like, what is even going on in this lab? I just, I don't even understand <laughs> what person with a brain in their head would think that any of this is a good idea. 
Okay, okay. Enough making fun of languages that suck. Let's talk about JavaScript. <laughs> if I say array.new 16, uh, or just array 16, I get an array of 16 things, which it represents as 16 commas, which is obvious. And uh, <laughs> if I then join those with a string, then I get the string 16 times. This is actually the only line in this entire presentation that's reasonable. Uh, now, if I take that string and then add a one to it, it interprets uh, the one as, or, or casts the one to his string, and then we get wat one a bunch of times, fine. Does anyone know what will happen if I subtract one from the string? <laughs> I'm assuming no one does. Let me, I'll give you a hint. Does, does this help? <laughs> does anyone know? Okay, um, so what I showed you here in, in a very funny way is basically the first point of why JavaScript is slow. Um, JavaScript has dynamic weak typing. Dynamic typing means that types are only known at runtime. This is pretty common for dynamic languages. And weak typing actually means all of this like crazy casting around between types that you saw in the words of JavaScript, uh, which is this famous presentation by Gary Bernhardt in 2012. Um, and this really makes it hard for the interpreter, um, for the JavaScript interpreter to find out which um, types are in which place of the code and it has to do a bunch of processing all the time. Second, there is the memory model, um, which is very similar to other dynamic languages. So objects only die once nobody uses them, which means you need to use a garbage collector. And that's not the hardest thing to do, but um, like making a fast garbage collector, a good garbage collector can be rather difficult. And finally, uh, there's the entire issue of names and binding, uh, with, with, with which I mean, um, boy, like which names refer to which variables and which scopes and like implicit, implicit this parameters and functions and that sort of stuff. Um, it's, it's hard to figure out all of that. Um, and also you have to figure out which uh, scopes to keep alive and which scopes can die and so on. That's a lot of, a lot of things to consider for the interpreter and not all of these can always be eliminated. So like names and binding is rather difficult, although the VA team has been doing some progress, uh, on the last, in the last couple of, uh, years. They, they posted about that. But yeah, it, some of these are uh, can be eliminated, some not. Um, and we'll talk about that shortly. So why was JavaScript speed even needed? Let's ask us that. So we are in like uh, 2006 and uh, JavaScript has started to be used in full complex web applications. Um, they have arrived in that time. And so JavaScript performance was an issue because people were doing like insanely complex things with JavaScript and a company like Google, they needed uh, fast JavaScript performance for their um, web apps like Google Mail and um, uh, Google Docs. So they were interested in creating a fast JavaScript engine and that's um, what they did with uh, V8 and with the Chrome browser release. So how do you write a fast JavaScript engine? Well, easy. You lock 10 to 20 top level Danish VM engineers in a farmhouse near Aarhus until they have created the fastest JavaScript engine. Success guaranteed. Supplementary requirements, last back. Um, so <laughs> that's of course partially a joke. Um, let's roll that up from the, from, from the back. Um, so they did take 2006 to 2008 uh, to develop V8 and they did actually develop um, V8 in a uh, in, in Buck's farmhouse for the first couple of months. That's not a joke. Um, so last Buck, let's, let's actually talk about him. He's a very important figure in this entire story. And yes, that's pretty much the highest quality image of the guy you can find on the internet. Um, so I think he's one of the most um, overlooked people in the history of JavaScript um, because um, in 1994 to 1997, he had worked uh, on Hotspot. Um, he had been doing a bunch of VM stuff before that and Hotspot at release was two times faster than uh, the then um, existing uh, JVM implementation by his son. 
and that was really surprising to the entire industry and of course you all know the word hotspot because to th this day it's the standard JVM because Sun bought it in 1997. And on the hotspot project was also Urs Helzle, um, who is a Swiss engineer. And um, he was later on one of the 10 first Google engineers to ever be hired. And by 2006, he was the vice president of technology. Um, and he basically hired back when they were setting up the V8 team in 2006. And that's how um, back came to Google and uh, created V8. Uh, so for the technical details, I'm just going to bluntly steal Google's uh, like Google Chrome release comic that was unfortunately leaked earlier. Like there's a whole PR story behind that. Um, you can you can read up on that and also you can read the full comic, which talks about a lot more stuff. But I'm just going to read out um, this this portion of the comic about V8 because nothing can explain it better than this. So we started with no code, just some wild ideas about how to make it go really fast, such as introducing hidden class transitions. JavaScript itself is classless. You can create a new object, dynamically add properties to it and go on. But in V8, as execution goes on, objects that end up with the same properties will share the same hidden class and we can start applying dynamic optimizations based on that. Another factor in V8 speed is dynamic code generation. When other JavaScript engines run, they look at the JavaScript source code and generate an internal representation of it they can interpret. But when you have to do interpretation, you have to look at the structure of your internal representation over and over again. So instead, V8 looks at the JavaScript source code and generates machine code that can run directly on the CPU that's running the browser. When you interpret once and compile machine code, then that code is your representation of the JavaScript source code and it doesn't need to be interpreted, it just runs. Finally, the core design flaw of current JavaScript engines is bad garbage collection behavior. JavaScript and other modern object-oriented programming languages have automatic memory management. If you don't have a reference to an object anymore, its memory can be reclaimed by the system, that's garbage collection and it's a fairly trivial process. But in existing JavaScript virtual machines, they use conservative garbage collection, which means that because you don't know exactly where all the pointers are, you start searching through the execution stack to see which words look like pointers. But the ones that sort of look like pointers could also be integers that just happen to have the same address as an object in the object heap. In V8, we are using precise garbage collection, so we know precisely where all the pointers are on the stack, and this gives us several advantages. One is that we can migrate an object to another place and just rewire the pointer. And because we know precisely where all the pointers are, we can also implement incremental garbage collection, meaning quick garbage collection round trips that are close to a few milliseconds, compared to processing all 100 megabytes of data, which could cause second long pauses. Yeah, so that's how V8 is faster than everyone else. And this is a graph for that, like that's after four months. They were 23 times faster than Firefox. I mean, this is just kind of ridiculous. Um, and it's pretty amazing. And it's like no understatement that on uh, Chrome and V8's release in 2008, it was a wake up call to the entire industry. Like everyone just realized, uh, oh shit, our our engine is way too slow and, and Google just crushed us. And basically everybody else was playing catch up and this introduced a new kind of battle to browsers like before browsers were competing on standard compatibility on features and so on like especially the early uh the first browser war was mostly fought on uh features but now browsers were fighting on performance and that sort of created this cycle which continues to this day where web developers write more and more complex apps that can run more and more complex javascript and um, because the engines is uh, the engine is so fast and browser developers and um, then have to catch up and write more and more performant engines and this sort of g goes on to today and javascript today is over a hundred times faster than 15 years ago Although, in fairness, I have to say, I was asked this during the live presentation. I don't know if this factors in um, processor speed improvements. Um, so I'll probably put something in the description if I uh, do some more research here. Yeah, uh, so th that's basically all about JavaScript. 
Um, in conclusion, I would say if the web was designed by amateurs, like, like Alan Kay said, then JavaScript is a programming language for the amateur. And that's one of its main factors for success. The other ones are its expansion of uh, scope, which I didn't really discuss here. Um, I, I could have had time actually, like um, with the expansion of scope, I also mean JavaScript stepping outside the browser and becoming a general purpose programming language, uh, which is of course what Node.js is all about. Uh, that's in the report. You can read up on that a bit more. It's not included here. Um, standardization, as I already said, was important factor of essential, especially winning the early language wars um, and of course performance as we just discussed. So now of course, what about WebAssembly? Well, um, WebAssembly, there was another report about that. So um, I didn't really take the time and discuss that a lot, but in my opinion, it's really the need for performance that we see on the web continued. So when JavaScript wasn't fast enough, we needed a language that was designed first for performance, like WebAssembly, um, to step in. Um, but in my opinion, I don't think it's likely that the language monopoly will change, and I hope that doesn't bite me in 10 years. Um, and like, I don't think WebAssembly will replace all of JavaScript uh, in a short time frame. Language monopolies change rather slowly. And I especially think that it will be rather a complement than a replacement. So WebAssembly will be used for this, uh, for these high performance applications where it's really needed and JavaScript will stay in use in all the other places. Yeah, so here's a big damn list of references. There's a lot of references. Um, thank you. That is a weird thing. I've never given a um, PowerPoint presentation on YouTube, uh, except for my first video, which essentially was a PowerPoint. <laughs> Either way, I hope you found this interesting. Again, I'm repeating myself. You can read up uh, the censored report in the description. Um, thank you very much for watching and goodbye.